What up guys, my name is Stan from Random Tens, and today's video is sort of a biggie. In fact, from the moment I released my Gen 2 review last December, I immediately had people asking me to take a look at the next installments in the Pokemon franchise. I'm not sure if this is because the video went over well or if Gen 3 is more popular than I thought, but regardless, here we are, finally taking a look at this much requested video. Now of course the plan was always to review Pokemon Emerald for the end of Pokemon 2016. However, depending on how this video does, I might be more inclined to review Gen 4 faster than I initially would have. But that's another topic for another day. For now though, we're looking at Gen 3. Is it worthy of being considered the best generation of all time, or is it just another rinse and repeat game in the series? Well, let's find out. The Games after the continued success of Gold and Silver, Pokemon was a global juggernaut, having sold tens of millions of games worldwide and undoubtedly many Nintendo handhelds in the process. As you'd imagine, this sort of money and acclaim led to the decision to continue the franchise past its initial conclusion with the Gen 2 games, and so Game Freak got right to work on a follow-up for their most lucrative IP. This time, however, original Pokemon creator and director Satoshi Tajiri took on a much more minimal role within the team and left his baby in the hands of famed composer-turned-director Junichi Masuda. With Masuda at the helm, it was decided that rather than continuing the story of Red and Ethan, this new installment would be intended as a reboot of sorts, utilizing the brand new Game Boy Advance as its hardware. This new system and direction gave the team a lot more freedom to create new worlds and features, and the soft reboot idea would eventually become a recurring mechanic in all subsequent main series games. And on March 19th, 2003, after years of grueling work, North America finally got their hands on the next installment in the blockbuster franchise, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. Despite being released to stateside at a time when Pokemon was experiencing its first real downswing, fans still came out in droves to purchase the brand new adventure, and these two games combined would eventually become the Game Boy Advance's best-selling titles. With Pokemania back in the spotlight, albeit to a much lesser degree, Game Freak decided to stay true to the classic formula and give fans a definitive version of the game in the form of Pokemon Emerald, released two years later. Now, although I bought Ruby along with a copy of Sapphire for my younger brother right after their initial launch, I never owned Emerald myself. However, I did play the main campaign on a friend's copy during a weekend getaway to his parents' farm. Yeah, I wasn't exactly the most active kid at 12 years old. Regardless though, Emerald always sort of stuck out to me as the director's cut version of the original Gen 3 games, and as such, I'll be using it as the main subject for most of my review. However, unlike Crystal, there are some real differences worth pointing out here, so I'll be sure to talk about the important changes between Emerald and its predecessors where necessary. And with that out of the way, let's take a look at Pokemon Emerald. The Story as I mentioned in the previous section, Gen 3 is a soft reboot of the series, however, most of the core plot mechanics from the Tajiri era are carried over into this game flawlessly. This time around, you take control of Brendan or May, a 10-year-old Pokemon enthusiast who's recently moved to a vast new region called Hoenn due to their father becoming one of its esteemed gym leaders. Immediately upon moving in, your dad runs off to his dream job and leaves you to make friends in your new hometown of Little Root. It's here that you'll meet your pseudo-rival, Brendan or May, depending on which gendered avatar you picked, and eventually their father the esteemed Professor Birch. Unlike Oak and Elm before him, Professor Birch enjoys working in the field as his research focuses on Pokemon habitats, but upon meeting him for the first time, it's clear he's bitten off more than he can chew as a wild Poochiana is attacking him. Now it's up to you to choose one of the game's three new starter Pokemon, save the Professor, and begin your Hoenn Pokemon adventure. I won't lie, I always really connected to this opening as a kid, as I could relate to the new town scenario, and I always thought the split second decision of choosing a Pokemon here made much more sense than just getting one because you're 10. You choose Use Trico, Torchic, or if you're like me in this particular playthrough, Mudkip to save someone, but like a real life animal would, it gets attached to you after your battle, and so the decision to go out collecting Pokemon feels more natural. Regardless, you eventually battle your rival, get a Pokedex, and then eventually make your way to Petalburg Gym, where your father commends you on your progress, but clarifies that you're still not at his level yet. It's here that you also meet your other pseudo-rival, Wally, for the first time. Wally is a sickly boy with a big passion for Pokemon, and with your help he eventually catches his own pocket monster and begins to feel confident once again. It's after you help out Wally and get rejected by your dad that our protagonist can battle the first gym leader, Roxanne, of Rustboro City. It's also in this area that you'll encounter the first instance of Team Aqua, a pirate-like organization who are up to no good. Now it's here that I have to address the first major change Emerald makes to its story, which is rather than have Team Aqua or Team Magma be the nefarious group of Gen 3, players must take on both. 
I will be giving my thoughts on this update later, but just know that minus a few extra team magma battles, the plot is virtually the same regardless of whichever version you choose, at least until very late in the story. Once Team Aqua's grunts are disposed of, you'll be thanked by Mr. Stone, the president of the Devon Corporation, and asked to deliver a letter to his son Steven. You'll also receive a new device known as the PokéNav, which sort of works as an all-purpose smartphone. And with a mission in hand, our hero ventures across the sea to Duford Town, where he delivers the letter to Steven Stone, a rock collector, after taking on the second gym leader, Brawly. Once the letter's been delivered, it's time to hit the open sea once again. However, this time our player travels to Slateport City, where they'll be confronted with Team Aqua's leader, Archie. He'll issue a stern warning not to get in his way again, and after delivering the Devon goods acquired during the first Aqua encounter to Captain Stern, it's time to head north to Mauville. It's here you'll battle both your rival and Wally once again on the way to and in Mauville City, respectively. Honestly, there's not much to say about May or Brendan here, however, in Wally's case, he's feeling much stronger since moving to the cleaner Verdanturf town, and makes it clear he wants to be a strong trainer too. It's also right here in Mauville that you can claim the third gym badge from the Electric Watson. Get it? And afterwards, you'll travel through many new routes and towns until you reach Team Magma in the hollowed out Meteor Falls. In all three versions, you'll actually run into both teams here, and in Emerald, it's also where you learn that Team Magma wishes to expand the world's landmass in order to… build model homes? I've actually always been pretty confused when it comes to their motivations, as even though theirs is just as dumb, you could argue Team Aqua's plan to expand the sea could be out of extreme activism, but then they'd die. Yeah, they're not the smartest crime organizations going, but even still, it's up to you and your Pokémon to thwart them whenever they might turn up again. Which is really soon, as you chase whichever team was driven out of Meteorite Falls up to Mount Chimney, where you'll battle its leader and prevent the apocalypse. Halfway through the game, and we've already saved the world once. You know, compared to the Radio Tower thing in Gen 2, these groups feel a lot more threatening. Anyways, when you finally disposed of the Red Plague, you'll be able to continue your adventure by beating Laveridge Town's Fire-type leader Flannery, and then making your way back to Petalburg to show your dad how much you've improved. Once defeated, Norman will award you with his gym's badge, as well as some encouraging words, and after picking up Surf next door from Wally's grateful father, it's time to head north towards Fortree City. On the way there, you'll have to battle Team Aqua or Magma again at the Weather Institute, depending on the version, but in terms of the city itself, this is one of my favorite areas in the entire game, as it's a wild forest utopia comprised of livable treehouses that make it radiate with identity. It's also in this town that you can battle Winona, the flying-type gym leader, after you've received the Devon Scope from our good friend Steven Stone. With the sixth badge added to your growing collection, you'll then be ready to visit Mount Pyre, where you'll once again run into Team Aqua's leader Archie, who's stolen the Red Orb in order to awaken the legendary Pokémon Kyogre. In the original two games, the player is given the remaining orb in order to counteract the evil plot. However, in Emerald, it's revealed that Maxi has already stolen the blue orb, and so you must take down both teams before it's too late. This is where my least favorite part of the campaign comes into play, as you'll be battling grunt after grunt and going back and forth across Hoenn in order to put an end to Team Magma and Team Aqua once and for all. This is of course made even worse in Emerald, as you have to effectively stop not one, but two evil crime organizations with what are effectively the exact same goals, and the games really don't do anything to make this slog feel more bearable. I'll touch on this a little bit more in depth in my con section later on, but in my brief opinion, it's the worst kind of padding, and it just makes the game slow down at this point. Eventually though, both parties lose control of their respective mascot legendary, and after obtaining the seventh badge from twins Tate and Liza in Moss Deep City, you'll travel to the Cave of Origins in Sotopolis City to set things right. In Ruby and Sapphire, it's here that you can catch either Groudon or Kyogre, which puts an end to the temporal chaos going on around the world. However, in Emerald, you must visit the Sky Pillar and awaken the legendary Pokémon Rayquaza, who basically just nags the other two into submission and then flies away. It's a little anticlimactic, but with things set right and Team Aqua and Team Magma coming to a truce, it's now time to claim your final gym badge from Juan in Cetopolis and take on the Pokémon League Challenge once again. Before you can make your mark, however, your old friend Wally shows up at Victory Road to see if you're strong enough to test your might, and in doing so, proves that he's grown up quite a bit since your last encounter. But after dispatching the green-haired Asthmatic, it's finally time to battle the Elite Four. First up this time around is Sidney, a Dark-type user. Like many of the Elite Four, Sid loves to use status-effective moves, and will mess your team up through strategy rather than sheer force, so it's always a good idea to stock up on berries and healing items before taking on this incarnation of the Pokémon League. After him, it's on to Phoebe, a Ghost-type user who seems sweet at first, but can send your Pokémon to the afterlife with one bad move. 
Once again, patience is key here, and soon you'll find yourself face to face with Glacia, the appropriately named ice type specialist of the Elite Four. My particular team had a few troubles with the Ice Queen, but overall I feel like she's actually the most forgiving member, and mainly serves as an appetizer to the Dragon Master of the Elite Four, Drake. <laughs> Drizzy here certainly isn't as tough as Lance, but his Pokemon do have far more type variety, and so if you want to beat this walking pirate stereotype, you're going to need a well-balanced team. Once he goes down, however, you'll be ready to take on the Hoenn Region Champion, Mr. Steven Stone. Uh, unless you're playing Emerald, in which case you'll be facing off against the former Cetopolis gym leader Wallace to see who's the true Pokemon master. Wallace is no pushover, but I've always felt like he was a poor replacement for Steven, especially from a narrative standpoint. Either way, when you finally emerge victorious and become the new champion of the Hoenn region, you'll meet up with old friends and have your name registered in the Pokemon Hall of Fame. A fitting end to a tumultuous journey. Of course, unlike Gold and Silver, this is the final act of the game, and beyond some exceptional post-game events and attractions, we've reached a definitive ending, at least story-wise. The Pros Something I've always appreciated is that along with the obvious one in regards to friendship and trust, each generation of Pokemon has its own distinctive theme and corresponding lessons that it tries to bring into the fold. For example, Generation 1 explores heavy themes involving science and the ambiguous ethics of experimenting on and corrupting nature. However, in this generation of games, the developers took a different approach and decided to bring nature to the forefront and explore themes of tampering with and manipulating our natural surroundings. In many ways, it's sort of a reversal of Gen 1, however, it doesn't leave much ambiguity at all. From Professor Birch to settings and locales to the new Pokemon, you get a sense the Game Freak wanted to reel in the science and myth and give players the most organic feeling Pokemon adventure yet, and I believe they succeeded in this regard. The theme of nature also directly ties into one of the many new features this game brought with it, which is the environment itself. Like the real world, the weather all around Hoenn changes based on various meteorological factors, including a Pokemon's move or ability. Not only does this create more immersive and visually appealing battles, but it also goes a long way in making this world feel more alive, and makes strategy that much more important. Along with this feature, Ruby and Sapphire were also the first core games to implement abilities and Pokemon natures into every past and present pocket monster, giving the games a much needed boost of strategy and challenge. Now, obviously Pokemon will never be the most complex of RPGs, but these two small additions really opened up the metagame to a variety of new options, and effectively created viability in competitive battles. Speed boost Blaziken, anyone? These games also expanded the ideas of IVs, that is, individual values, and boosted each Pokemon's from 15 to 31 in each main category. This allowed even more variety, and along with nature's really helped turn breeding into its very own genre of Pokemon game. Another obvious addition to the series that always makes me smile is the new double battle mechanic. It seems so simple and like such a mainstay now, but even to this day, I would still much rather lock eyes with two trainers rather than one. Personally, I think this opens up the game to more strategy as well as allows other Pokemon to grow faster if they're at a slight level disadvantage. Plus, seeing new and unique ways of Pokemon working together never gets old, and by far I think double battles may be my favorite new addition to come out of Gen 3. While mixing up the battle formula, the developers also tried their hands at creating new and inventive ways in which to use Pokemon. First up we have Contest, a type of optional minigame that allows trainers a way to show off the appeal of their prized pocket monsters rather than their power. As you can probably tell from the lack of footage, collecting ribbons from these contests was never really my thing, but I sort of think that's the point. This gave players who prefer the cosmetic appeal of Pokemon more ways to bond with their virtual creatures, and although the mechanics could use some work, the idea itself is at least fresh, which still makes it a winner in my books. Another new minigame style addition is the inclusion of the secret base. All around Hoenn, you'll find small holes and walls, or enormous tree bushes that you can use a new TM, Secret Power, to hollow out and build yourself a personalized fort. Now, although Contest had the option of using a link cable to play with others, it never really caught on in the same way that Secret Bases did with my small group of friends. As a 10 year old, I spent an embarrassing amount of hours trying to find the best furniture and most spacious cave to house my special tree fort, all so I could then compare and contrast with the other kids at my babysitters. There's mostly no point to it of course, but it was a fun little addition nonetheless that I think also mildly expands the role of nature in these games. However, finally, in what may be the most famous post-game feature, we have the illustrious Battle Frontier. Now, sadly, this battle-heavy island is an Emerald exclusive, but in my opinion, this is the reason why that game stands apart. Home to seven different types of battling buildings, the Frontier is what you get when you take the Battle Tower from Ruby and Sapphire and inject it full of Polka steroids. 
It's owned and operated by a shady man named Scott, who's been bumping into our protagonist since the first main town, and with his blessing, you can take the Frontier Challenge and truly prove your abilities. Depending on which facility you tackle first, you'll discover a varying degree of challenge, as each dome or arena boasts its own type of unique battling structure. But no matter which you choose, after enough victories, you'll be challenged by the respective building's Frontier Brain, who can be a real pain in the ass to reach. In fact, I spent multiple hours just trying to capture footage of one of these Frontier Brains, and even then it was only at the silver level and I just happened to win because my Waylord knew a ghost type move. So yeah, the Battle Frontier is no walk in the park, but trust me when I say that when playing the game for fun rather than a long winded review, this one post game feature adds dozens of additional hours of content, and I truly believe this is Emerald's greatest strength. And speaking of post-game, this may sound blasphemous, but next to Gen 2's Secret Kanto Surprise, I wholeheartedly believe that these games have the strongest after credits adventure of any core Pokemon experience. Once the Elite Four is beaten for the first time, you'll find yourself going off and hunting down tons of legendary Pokemon, as well as probably checking out most of the optional features like contests once the main campaign is finished. Depending on which version you have, the legendaries will be slightly different in terms of what you can add to your collection, with Kyogre and Latias being Sapphire exclusives, and Groudon and Latios being rubies. And in the case of Emerald, you basically get a shot at catching all three Hoenn mascots, although you actually get a choice as to which Eon Pokemon you want, however, without a cheating device, it's almost impossible to obtain the other, especially nowadays. Despite being roaming Pokemon, Latios and Latias aren't nearly as annoying as the legendary beasts from Gen 2. And in fact, I actually ran into the one I chose, Latias, while surfing near Pacifilodge Town while completing another post-game quest, The Secret of the Regis. Yes folks, on top of featuring two brand new legendary roaming Pokemon, as well as three mascot legendaries, we're also treated to another trio, the legendary golems. Unlike the legendary birds or the legendary beasts, Regirock, Registeel, and Regice can only be unlocked after the player completes what may be the most cryptic puzzle in all of Pokemon history. In fact, I would go as far as to say that this is some Castlevania 2 red crystal type levels of bullshit, hey! and you know what? I like it. Unlike that game, Gen 3 was one of those juggernaut titles that almost every other kid on the playground had, so word of mouth was much more common on the schoolyard, and even without having reliable internet at the time, I was still able to complete the puzzles with the help of a few knowledgeable friends. And it's the initial intrigue and the way it leads to this sort of communication that I think makes this series so great in the first place. And despite not caring too much about the Regis themselves, the mystery surrounding them was always one of my favorite parts of exploring Hoenn's post-game world. Now, before I move on to the cons, there are a few more positives I want to address. In terms of music, once again, each new town and each new theme breathes just a little more life into these games, and I feel like this is the gen where composer Go Ichinois really came into his own. Yes, there are a lot of trumpets, and no, I don't think the music is more iconic than Gen 1's, but there are a ton of standout tracks like the Surf theme that I would rank among the series best. I'm not going to get too in depth into the music, as I feel like the whole it's great but not as iconic as Gen 1 thing will be a recurring theme among the remainder of these in-depth reviews, but some of my personal favorite tracks include Old Dale Town, Slateport City, Route 110, Verdant Turf Town, Route 113, the Battle Frontier main theme, and many, many more. And finally, one of the best parts of this game is the inclusion of Wally. He's not exactly a rival in this game, in fact, he's almost like your apprentice in a lot of ways, but he's a solid character who feels shut out, and a lot of this game's about him taking back control of his life and doing the things he wants to do, and I think that makes him pretty relatable. Of course, I could also go into detail about how he's only able to do all of this after gaining a friend in our hero, as well as moving to a town untampered by pollution, therefore reaffirming the whole friendship is king and leave nature alone themes the game's trying to present, but honestly, he doesn't need all of that analysis. He's just a likable character who grows along with you, and although he's certainly no silver, is so much better than the other pseudo-rival in this game. Speaking of which... <laughs> The cons. As some of you likely noticed when talking about the story, the rival character, that is Brendan or May, started to have less of an impact and just sort of faded off altogether. This wasn't a deliberate choice, but in actuality that's just sort of what the game does with this character. Sure, I skipped a few of the later battles in my rundown, but that's because your rival in this game starts off great and then just sort of becomes an afterthought. In fact, it's actually Wally who you battle with before the Elite Four, not Brendan or May, which sort of summarizes everything wrong about this character's inclusion. 
I love the idea of this person being the professor's kid and all, but what's their true purpose? What's their end goal? I mean, I know they want to follow in their dad's footsteps, but considering they never even fully evolved their starter Pokemon, that sort of seems like a bad career choice. It's not that I dislike them entirely, but at the end of the day, they have the smallest impact of the series so far throughout these reviews, and when they show up to congratulate you for beating the Elite Four, you sort of wish Wally came instead. And speaking of the Elite Four, who thought making Wallace the champion in Emerald version was a good idea? It's not even that he's a bad trainer, it's just compared to Steven, he's practically a stranger. It's clear that this was added in to give players of Ruby and Sapphire a little shock when they made it to the end of Emerald to prove that this game's different. But in my opinion, this is one instance where that doesn't work. Heck, even the games would canonically make Steven the Hoenn League champion once again in both future games and the eventual remake, so it's clear that even Game Freak knew this was a major misstep. And one can't talk about missteps without bringing up Emerald's handling of Team Aqua and Team Magma. Let me get this straight right now. In terms of gameplay and battling, Emerald is the far superior game. However, in terms of the overall narrative and pacing, Ruby and Sapphire are actually the best options. Not only do they have a champion who feels earned, but battling against one evil team is more than enough. The amount of backtracking, especially in Emerald, feels absolutely chore-like, and was clearly only introduced to pad out the game. Besides that though, I think Team Aqua and Team Magma as groups are a mixed bag when it comes to quality. They solve my no identity problem from the last review by having specific themes, motifs, colors, and even leaders that are all their own. All of this stuff combined does give them an identity, especially compared to the black and white Team Rocket, and it absolutely makes them memorable. My only gripe is that their plans make no sense. Team Magma wants to cover the world in land, but once again there's no motivation for why. It would sort of make sense if they worshipped Groudon and the only way to revive him is by expanding the current landmass, but even that's not a great reason and it's certainly not what they're after here. And as I mentioned in the story section, Aqua's just as bad as their red counterparts because submerging the entire world in water means that they'll drown. So yeah, sorry guys, but their motives just don't cut it for me in these games. As for the whole too much water thing, it never really bugged me. In fact, when I think of Hoenn, I fondly remember it as the beautiful tropical region with lots of waterfalls and the cool underwater city. I will however say that the utilization of HMs in this game is ridiculous. Surf and a few others are obviously fine, but man oh man does it suck when you have to effectively plan your party around HMs. For example, I wasn't planning on having two water types and a Hariyama on my team, but because this game goes out of its way to force the player into using HMs like Dive and Rock Smash at every turn, I found myself having to build my team around both battle ability and usefulness on the map, and it's just a little too much here for my tastes. I mean, you can argue that Gen 1 also used a lot of HMs to solve puzzles, especially later in the games, but with those installments it felt like necessary padding due to tech limitations. Here it just feels like intentional bloat. And besides the unnecessary padding, that's my only real gripe with this generation of games. At times, they really try to recapture that Gen 1 magic instead of just doing their own thing. Not all the time, mind you, but enough that it does keep reminding you of Kanto. Now I know that Gen 1 is iconic for a reason, and creating an improved game while keeping that feel should sound like a smart decision, but I think in hindsight it's a little frustrating because only a few years later we actually got Gen 1 remakes using the exact same engine. And for those wondering, I'm not just talking about actual events in the game, such as the first gym having a rock type leader, or three of the four Elite Four members sharing typing with their Gen 1 incarnation. I'm speaking more to the fundamentals of the game, the progression. It's not that these games have no originality, I think they keep things pretty fresh actually, just in general, I wish they took a few more risks 13 years ago, because maybe then we wouldn't be stuck in this perpetual loop of soft reboots, but that's a discussion for another day. And with those little nitpicks out of the way, I think it's time we start to wrap this up after one final category, the Pokemon themselves. The Pokemon In past installments of these reviews, I've talked about the good and bad generational Pokemon in the pros and cons sections respectively, but with this video I figured I'd switch it up. Firstly, Ken Sugimori and his team did a great job of making nearly every Pokemon feel like an organic extension of the Hoenn region. From more animalistic designs like Corphish and Walrein, to Pokemon that incorporate weather and climate into their actual designs like Swablu or Tropius, this is the generation for those who prefer natural looking Pokemon rather than the scientific or machine looking ones we see more of today. Some of my personal favorites include Sceptile, Ludicolo, Gardevoir, 
Slaking, Shedinja, Nosepass, Mawile, Metacham, Manetric, Sharpedo, Flygon, Altaria, Cradley, Duskull, Tropius, Absol, Glalie, and most of the legendaries. However, despite there being so many good ones, there's few that I would consider great, and there's also still a few odd or forgettable ones, including Mightyena, Lombre, Surskit, Gulpin, Spoink, Spinda, Cacnea, Baltoy, and Love Disk. Once again, I want to state that I don't hate any of its designs, but to me and probably a few others, Gen 3 is that generation that has very few bad additions, but rarely introduces iconic ones. Again, it's all good, just not great. Also, I totally forgot Grumpig was even a Pokemon, let alone from way back in Gen 3. Whoops. So overall, there's a lot of good to this game, and there's some bad or uninspired aspects as well, but having compiled all of these highlights and lowlights, let's throw them into my thought blender and finally wrap this up. Final Verdict You know, it's funny, because as a kid, I went absolutely nuts over these three games. Between them all, I probably poured more than 500 hours into the Hoenn region, and I don't regret a single second of it, because I still love these games to death. I think they took one of the most iconic games of all time, and rebooted them into something a little more accessible, a little more challenging, and a lot more immersive, and I would highly recommend either of these three to any fan of the series. In fact, I would still go as far as to say that these are still the superior versions when compared to their 2014 remakes for those who like a little more challenge in their Pokemon experiences. And in terms of pure battling and strategy, I don't know if you'll ever find a game with more to do than Emerald. The game's got great characters, epic set pieces, fun mechanics, and the best post-game experience Gen 2 notwithstanding. So what are you waiting for? If you recently rediscovered the franchise thanks to the likes of Pokemon Go, or are just a die-hard fan of the series who hasn't taken on the original Hoenn adventure in quite a while, I think it's the perfect time that you pack your bags, strap on your running shoes, and break out your old SP. Pokemon Generation 3 gets an A. Minus. It's a phenomenal entry in the never-ending adventure series, but some pacing issues at the very end, as well as some confusing motivations, just keep it from being perfect. Well, that went longer than expected. They always do. But I hope you guys enjoyed reliving a little piece of my childhood with me today, and I hope you're just as excited for the next installment in this series. Of course, no Gen 3 review could be complete without talking about some very important remakes. And so, next time on this show, we're going to be taking a look at Fire Red and Leaf Green for the Game Boy Advance. I know, I know, Pokemon is turning into a whole Poke Summer, but with the 20th anniversary, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Anyways, I'm hoping to get that out in the next few weeks, and I really hope that you guys join me for that mini-review. But until then, follow us on Twitter, at RandomTens, if you have any questions or you just want to talk. And as I always say, happy hunting, baby rhinos. Blah! I don't know what that was. Peace.